this is an exciting moment, or an exciting moment for me anyway. Uh, this is my first venture into the world of making an A-level tutorial video. Uh, I've done loads of GCSE ones thus far, but this is a, a bit of a trial into how I can go about putting A-level videos together. So it's going to be a bit hit and miss, I'm afraid, uh, but then they're usually a bit hit and miss. Uh, but let's get going. Um, this might be uh, a process that you would look at in your second year of your A-level. Uh, you might make a solid, an organic solid, and you then are required to recrystallize it. And the reason you're required to recrystallize it is that that's a method we use for purifying it. And just think about the term recrystallize or recrystallization. So in other words, you're going to reform crystals. So you're going to do a process where your crystals that maybe you've spent a whole day making disappear. And then you need to make them reappear. In other words, you need to make them recrystallize. So let's get on with it. Let's see how we do it. Now, I apologise, I've pinched this diagram and adapted it and pilfered it and changed it off the internet. Um, I'm hopeless at drawing diagrams. Um, so, we're going to talk through all the stages we're going to use for our purification process. So, here's our solid, and that's the solid that we want to purify. And, first of all, we're going to dissolve it in the minimum amount of a solvent. Okay, now I'm going to talk about how we choose that solvent later, but it says here measure amount of solvent. You want to use the minimum amount. Okay, the solvent should also be hot. So you keep this conical flask warm, okay, and you keep adding solvent to it, and you stir it. Okay, and eventually the solid dissolves. So here you have a solution of product okay, and soluble impurities. Okay, now also in there you're going to have some insoluble impurities. So impurities that even in the hot solvent do not dissolve. So first of all you're going to get rid of those insoluble impurities. So they're little crystals, little grains of solid um, and you're going to take your flask here. Now you can see on the right hand side we've managed to get, uh, because I've twisted the diagram, uh, a liquid which is uh, not obeying the uh, laws of gravity. It's sort of hanging in mid-air uh, and not pouring out. Obviously when you tilt your flask like this it is going to pour out and in there we had our insoluble impurities there we have them and rather than just pour them from one conical flask to the next we need to get those crystals out of there so we're going to filter it and we'll use a filter funnel with a massive, oh that's terrible, why have, I, why have I decided to draw such a massive filter funnel? Okay, that's, that's woeful, even by my diagrams. Um, so that's a bit more dainty, uh, it's still pretty terrible, uh, that's better. Okay, so there's my filter funnel, and inside your filter funnel you're going to have a piece of filter paper. Now one of the things which is important about that filter funnel is that it's hot. We're going to do a hot filtration. And the reason it's necessary to have the filter funnel hot is that if this hot solvent here hits a cold funnel, all of a sudden your crystals which have dissolved are going to precipitate out. They're going to recrystallize in here. And they're going to be stuck in there along with your insoluble impurities. And that's not really what we want. Okay, we're trying to get rid of these insoluble impurities. So we pour the mixture into there and you'll get your specks of insoluble impurities and you'll get your liquid coming through into there. 
okay? And that again will be your solution of product and your soluble impurities. Okay, all you've removed were those insoluble impurities which have stayed in the funnel here. So, we now want to separate out the product from the soluble impurities. And to do that, you take your conical flask and you cool it down. You might then put it in an ice bath. So an ice bath being just almost an ice, ice cream tub with some ice around it. Okay, And even then your crystals might struggle to recrystallize. So you might need to stir this solution like crazy okay, with a glass rod and scratch at the side of the conical flask to provide an aggregation point for those crystals to grab onto and then recrystallize out. So now what we've got in here, and you can see here are our crystals, and here's our solvent, and that contains the soluble impurities. And I think it's worth noting that down on the diagram there, that those impurities are the soluble ones. The insoluble ones were left behind during this hot filtration phase. Now you need to get your crystals out of here, so you're going to pour the crystals and the mixture into a Buckner funnel, great word Buckner, into a Buckner funnel uh, which the flask underneath is attached to a vacuum. So you're going to do something called vacuum filtration. And vacuum filtration is an absolute winner. Uh, it's nice and quick and it produces a relatively dry product. Okay, it's not, a, it's not a completely dry product, but it's a relatively dry product. So it's nice and quick, and it produces a dry product. So here are our crystals sitting on top of the little piece of filter paper. They're not perfectly dry, so the crystals now need to be dried properly. So dry the crystals. So how I would do, normally do that is to get two pieces of filter paper and press the crystals between these two big bits of filter paper uh, to take out any excess moisture and then leave the crystals overnight in a warm place um, to dry them out properly. So that's the method and you need to obviously know the method but in each step of the method you need to understand why you do each step. Why is it necessary to dissolve in a minimum amount of solvent? And we'll talk about that in a minute. Why do we do a hot filtration here? And I covered that. I said it was to ensure that the product, the thing which we want the, the thing which we're looking to purify, doesn't crystallize out at this point. It doesn't recrystallize. So we're only filtering out the insoluble impurities. Why do we use a Buckner funnel for the filtration here? Okay, because it's quick, okay, and it produces a relatively dry product. Why would you not dry your product over a Bunsen burner? Why would you dry the crystals in a warm room rather than over a Bunsen burner? And the crystals might be thermally unstable, okay, they might break down um, at high temperatures. Um, so that might be that might be a reason. It might not be. Um, they might not be thermally unstable, but it's better better to be safe than sorry. And if you don't need to dry them very quickly, why not just keep them in a warm room? Uh, why would you use an ice bath here? Well, the solubility of the crystals will be much lower at a lower temperature. In other words, at a low temperature the crystals don't want to dissolve. So that's why we would use an ice bath, okay, to ensure the crystals actually recrystallize. Why would we use a hot solvent here? Okay, why is the solvent here hot? And that's to ensure that our product does actually dissolve. So I'm afraid that was a little bit all over the place in terms of justifying the stages I've I've jumped around a little bit, 
Um, so what I recommend you do is you print out um, the diagram or you make some notes, but make sure that the diagram tells the story of the recrystallization and annotate it with justifications for each stage. What I'm going to look at now is how we choose our solvent. Okay, Why do I not just say we use the minimum amount of water or the minimum amount of ethanol? How do we go about choosing that solvent? So, these are the questions you have to ask yourself if you're trying to decide on the solvent. Now, usually at A level, they'll tell you which solvent to use. Um, so, the product must be sparingly soluble in the solvent. In other words, when the solvent is hot, the product dissolves. The process won't work if the product doesn't dissolve when it is hot. However, when the solvent is cold, the product does not dissolve. We need to make sure that the product can dissolve and reappear. Now, if the product dissolves when it is cold, whilst it's going to be possible to dissolve the product, it's not going to recrystallize out in that final step. It's not going to reappear. So it needs to be soluble when the solvent is hot and insoluble when the solvent is cold. Now we use the minimum amount of solvent and we use the minimum amount because if we use too much the product again might not recrystallize out at the end. We also need to consider safety matters when heating the solvent. This substance here is ethanol. So you don't want to be heating ethanol over a Bunsen flame because it's flammable. So you'll need to use a water bath to heat it. And taking the water from a kettle maybe. Okay. This substance here is dichloromethane. Now that's a toxic substance. Okay, you don't want to be heating dichloromethane in the laboratory. Okay, in the, certainly in the open laboratory. So you might want to use a fume covered if the solvent is toxic. Now, at the end of the experiment, you want a pure product. How do you know if the product is pure? So, first of all, like any organic chemist, you're going to test the melting point. Okay, And you might know what melting point you're aiming for. So, once you've got your melting point by using the melting point apparatus, compare this to a data book. Okay? And if your result is nice and close to the data book value, well, that suggests you've got a pure product. You'll also see that when you're doing a melting point test, the solid will melt over a range of temperatures. Now, if you've got an impure product, the range of temperature, it might start to melt at, let's say, a number off the top of my head, 130. And the product finishes melting at 138 degrees Celsius. Now that's quite a wide range. That's 8 degrees Celsius. The narrower the range over which your product melts, the purer your product is. So if you're doing your experiment and then you um, tested the impure product and it melts over that range, and you then test your pure product and it melts between 137 and 138 degrees Celsius, you know that your product here is much purer than your original value. You could also run a chromatogram on the product. Now chromatography is stu studied at A level and you might not have met it yet, um, but you could run a chromat chromatogram on your product and you can see here this is a again a diagram cut and pasted off the internet um, showing the chrom chromatography of an, a certain ink and you can see the, the ink has lots and lots of different components. Now if you do chromatogram with your pure product, you will only get one spot appearing on your chromatography paper 
and that shows you that you have a pure product.